this video's section 4.9, which is titled scope, scope of inference. Um, so making an inference or inferring is when a sample is selected at random, we can use the results of the study to draw conclusions about the population. So I'm inferring about the population based on what I saw from the sample because it was selected at random. Um, so the sample should reasonably represent the larger population. That's the point of randomizing the sample. Um, if we select a different random sample, we should not expect the result to be exactly the same every time. So what happens is something called sampling variability. Um, this is when different random samples of the same size from the same population produce different estimates. Increasing the size of the sample may not change the center of the statistic, but it should always decrease the variability. Meaning, the bigger the sample we have, the closer and closer to the true population parameter we get. And so, if I create bigger and bigger samples, the variability of that difference that we assume will happen because they're different samples um, will get less and less each time. The last thing that um, we'll talk about in this is something being statistically significant. So something is statistically significant. If the results are too unusual to be explained by chance alone. So if a sample result occurs less than 5% of the time by chance alone, it's unlikely to happen to, due to chance variation from the random assignment. Okay, so it's unusual if it occurs less than 5% of the time. Um, so let's look at an example where we're applying this idea. So a consumer agency wants to determine which of the two laundry detergents, A or B, cleans better. 50 pieces of fabric, fabric are subjected to the same kinds of stains, grass, mud, coffee. Then 25 pieces are randomly assigned to be cleaned with detergent A and the remaining 25 will be cleaned with detergent B. After being laundered, the pieces of fabric are rated on a scale from one to 10 with one being the least clean and 10 being the most clean. The difference in the mean ratings, A minus B, was determined to be negative 2.3. Assuming there is no difference in the two detergents, 200 simulated differences in the sample means are displayed on the dot plot. So they find that difference, A minus B. Um, so since that was a negative 2.3, that means that B had better ratings overall, right? So zero would mean that they had the same ratings. If I'm subtracting A minus B and I get a negative rating, that means B is better in that sample. And if I'm subtracting, I get a positive rating, that means that A is better in that sample. Okay, so there's the dot plot. They're telling us that the mean is 2 point negative 2.3 in one sample. Using the dot plot and the difference in mean ratings from the samples, is there convincing evidence that one detergent is better than the other? So if I look at negative 2.3, so this would be negative 2.5. So negative 2.3 might be that dot or around that dot. And so let's look at what our options are happening over here. So yes, because a difference in mean rating of negative 2.3 or less occurred only five out of 200 times, meaning the difference is statistically significant and there's convincing evidence that A is more effective than B. Or yes, because the difference in mean rating of negative 2.3 or less occurred only five out of 200 times, meaning the difference is statistically significant and there is convincing evidence that B is more effective than A. So if it was less, there's five less than, um, that are less than negative 2.3. So if I do five out of 200, 
that's going to give me a percentage of um, two and a half. So that's about two and a half percent, which is less than 5%, right? So less than 5% of the time, the detergent's um, difference is negative 2.3 or less. So that means that that result is significantly, is statistically significant. And remember that if it's in that range, that means that B is better. Oops, I thought I had a highlighter, sorry. That means that B is better. And so that means that B is the correct answer. For the next example, a teacher tells her students that a, a large jar of marbles contains 55% red marbles. Students randomly select a sample of 40 marbles and determine the proportion of red marbles. One sample contained 18 red marbles. Assuming the teacher's claim is true, 100 simulated proportions are displayed on the dot plot. So if we're looking at 18 red marbles, From a sample of 40 marbles, that proportion of that sample was 0.45. So if we look at 0.45 on our dot plot, so that's here, and we want to figure out if that's statistically significant, we want to see if the lower values um, occurred within a st statistical significance. So if I'm looking at that, that means that I want to see, okay, how many values were 4.5 or less, okay? Because the true, the mean that they're claiming, right, is 55%. So they're claiming that this is the mean. They got a 0.45, a 45%. We want to see if getting less than that is statistically significant. And so if we look at this, 4.5 or less, they're saying is 16 times for each of these. So I'm going to assume that they're correct, right? So if I do 16, so there's 16 of those dots. So if I divide 16 um, out of 100, that's 16% which is not less than 5%. So that means that it is not significant. So, so yes, because the proportion that is significant, so this is essentially the opposite of what we're looking for. So we want to know because this, yeah, so the sample proportion of red marbles is not signif statistically significant. And so there's not convincing evidence that the teacher's claim is false. Okay, so we're comparing that this sample had 18 red marbles, which was a 45%. The teacher claimed it was 55%. Since 45 is less than 55, we looked at how many, what the percentage of marbles samples were less than that 45% to determine if that number was less than 5%, our answer would be um, B instead. Finally, um, one thing to think about is what I can make inferences about. So if the sample is not randomly selected, then I can't make an inference about the larger population only population members like them. If the treatment groups are random, I can make inferences about cause and effect. So in this, these examples, we're going to look at situations and we're identifying essentially which part was randomized or which parts were randomized. And that tells us what we can make inferences about. So if the sample itself is randomized, I can make inferences about the population. If it's not, then I can only make inferences about things like that sample. 
if the treatment groups are randomized, I can make inferences about cause and effect. If the treatment groups are not, I cannot make inferences about cause and effect. So in this example, a florist wants to determine if a new additive would extend the life of cut flowers longer than the original. They randomly select 20 carnations from the ones recently delivered by their greenhouse. Um, and then randomly assigns 10 to the new additive and 10 to the original. After three weeks, six carnations placed in the new additive still looked healthy and two placed in the original additive still looked healthy. The proportion of healthy carnations with the new additive was significantly greater than the proportion of healthy carnations with the original additive. Which of the following is a valid conclusion? So since she randomly assigned the treatment, that means that we can make inferences about the cause and effect. Okay, but so then when we're looking at the carnations though, there's a problem because these are carnations that were recently delivered by the greenhouse. Um, she's not actually creating a random sample. So even though she's randomly selecting them, they would need to be all of the carnations in the greenhouse. See how she's selecting the new carnations in the greenhouse? Um, so this is not randomized which means that we can't make an inference about the population. Okay, so this is not gonna re represent all carnations. So we're looking for an answer that says that I can do, I can make a conclusion about cause and effect, but I cannot make a conclusion about the entire population. Um, so I this can't be true, okay? So it's not A or B. It can be concluded the new additive caused the extended life of the cut flowers, yes? And this inference can only be applied to carnations from the greenhouse, okay? So then the last one is that neither is true, right? So the correct answer here is C. Finally, a botanist wants to determine if a fertilizer is effective on the growth of plants. He selects the first 100 plants of the same type seedling from a greenhouse and assigns the first 50 to the group that uses fertilizer and the remaining seedlings to the group that does not use fertilizer. He makes sure the plants have the same amount of water, soil, and light for two months. Um, at the end of the two months, he measures the heights of the plants and finds the ones receiving fertilizer are significantly taller. So one thing to notice is that he selects the first 100 plants of the same type of seedling from a greenhouse. This is not random. That means that we cannot make a conclusion about the population. Then he just assigns the first 50 to a group that uses the fertilizer. This is also not random. So the sample was not a random sample, nor were the treatment groups. So this means that we cannot make any conclusion about cause or effect. So that means that we can't make any conclusions based on his results because he didn't randomly select the sample or assign the treatment groups. Um, so inference is not true. Inferences cannot be made for all plants. The conclusion can be drawn. That is not true also, right? So I can't draw a conclusion or um, make inferences. Inferences can be made for this type of plants. No, inferences cannot be made for these types of plants and the conclusion cannot be drawn, right? So this one is the correct answer because both of those were not randomized.